The killer or killers of five college students may still be in the Gainesville area tonight. Over the course of four days, a serial killer terrorized the college students of Gainesville, Florida in a murderous rampage. Despite huge media coverage, the killer was never actually caught for his crimes. It was only when he was arrested for an unrelated burglary charge that he confessed to some of the most horrific murders in Florida's history. Then, a few short years later, the Gainesville murders became even more infamous when they helped inspire the classic horror movie Scream. This is the grisly true story of the events that took place in August of 1990. So buckle up as we drive off into the sunset of mysteries in tonight's episode, The Gainesville Ripper. Sunday, August 26th, 1990. 56-year-old Patricia Powell and her husband Frank pull into a parking lot of a three-story apartment complex. Their daughter, 17-year-old Christine, was just accepted and going to start her freshman year at the university. Her father was so proud that upon receiving her acceptance letter, purchased her a gift, a necklace and a charm resembling the school's mascot. Two days before Patricia and Frank Powell arrived in the parking lot, Christine and her roommate, 18-year-old Sonia Lawson, whom she met prior during summer school, had already finished unpacking their belongings. Afterwards, the two went out to get something to eat at a local restaurant and Christine used a payphone to update her parents on the move and how happy and excited she was about her roommate. She then told her parents she would call them the following day. But the following day came and that phone call from Christine didn't. Now, she had not set up a landline, so there was no way of her parents to call her, but Patricia and Frank seen this as a means of her daughter being too busy and enjoying life as a freshman in college, which was understandable to them at the time, so they seen no red flags. Fast forward to that Sunday morning on August 26th in the parking lot, where Christine's parents were parked, Although they hadn't heard from their daughter, they were convinced nothing was wrong and Christine was expecting them, so it's not like a surprise if they were to show up. So, upon entering the building, they find themselves on the second level using the stairs. They approach their daughter's apartment and notice handwritten notes stuck all over the front door. Apparently, these were from fellow students and possibly teachers leaving messages to Christine and Sonia, letting them know that they had stopped by. Christine's parents continue to knock on the door and begin to panic once nobody answers. They leave the building and find a maintenance worker and explain the situation. After seeking permission from the school and contacting the Gainesville police, an officer is sent out to investigate. As a precaution, the officer asks the Powells to stay inside as he goes into the apartment with the maintenance man. Calling out for the two girls and getting no response, the officer continues to walk through the apartment and the maintenance man notices something by the couch and immediately rushes outside of the apartment screaming, sobbing uncontrollably and starts to vomit right in front of Christine's parents. At that very moment, her parents ran into the apartment where they found their daughter's body on the ground. Christine was lying on her back, no clothes, and appears to have been stabbed to death. Whoever killed her positioned her in a lewd sexual pose in attempts to demean and shock whoever discovered this poor girl's body. The officer continues to search the first floor, finding nothing, then moves to the second where he finds Sonia lying in her bed, stabbed to death as well. She was also naked and positioned in a demeaning pose. It was later determined that Christine was sexually assaulted, but Sonia was not. 
a forensic team on site had discovered on the outside of the door frame leading into the apartment that there were markings proving somebody had used a screwdriver to pop open the door. The towels and soap were also found near Christine's body, which must have been used to clean up the evidence. Her wrists showed signs of being tied and duct taped, but when she was discovered, her hands were free. This suggests the poor girl was tied while this man assaulted her. The police were convinced they were up against a group or someone who targeted these two girls particularly, and that if they weren't going to get caught, they'd kill again. Now having no solid evidence, not to mention it's the beginning of the school year, Gainesville is flooded with students, which would make it harder for the investigation. That following Monday, classes began, police put up bulletins all over town letting the residents know to stay indoors, suggesting that if you were out and about, to make sure you were in groups and to stay vigilant. Twelve hours before Christine Powell and Sonia Lawson were discovered, an 18-year-old Gainesville woman named Krista Hoyt didn't show up for work. She was a student at Santa Fe Community College and that year she had planned to transfer to the University of Florida where she would afterwards pursue a career in forensics for the FBI. Now showing interest in law enforcement, she had a part-time job at the sheriff's office, working the records department. She was famously known for not missing a day of work, even showing up shortly after having her wisdom teeth pulled on one occasion. So on this Saturday night, when the sheriff's office couldn't get a hold of Krista, they asked Gainesville police to do a welfare check. They arrive, knock on the door of her apartment with no answer. The door is locked, so one of the officers goes around back and knocks on the sliding door to no avail. He then notices a drape inside the apartment covering the sliding door isn't long enough to touch the floor, leaving just enough space for them to look inside the apartment if he had laid on the ground. So the officer does just that, flashes his light through the apartment, and that's when he sees Krista's body. Far away from the door, hunched over on the edge of her bed, no clothes, facing the direction of the door. She also has stab wounds on her back, and her head is missing. It was next to the bed on a shelf positioned by the killer in a way to where it appeared to be looking down at the detached body. Her hands also bear marks of being tied up at one point but are removed afterwards. A forensic team also noticed the marks around the sliding door frame showing someone used either a screwdriver or some sort of tool to pop open the door. It was also determined Krista was sexually assaulted before being murdered. The similarities between the two university students and Krista were only obvious to the Gainesville police, the only ones aware of what was going on at the time because most of the information wasn't public. So that Sunday evening, police went to the media and asked them to put out a bulletin, letting the citizens of Gainesville know that a killer or killers are on the loose. It wasn't long before news anchors and Gainesville residents speculated that Christina Powell and Sonia Lawson's murder were related with Krista Hoyts. Being less than two miles apart and probably occurred within the past 24 to 48 hours, so it wasn't hard for the people to figure out that the two cases were connected. Hundreds of officers took to the streets, patrol vehicles on every corner, in attempts to discourage the killer or killers from striking again. Soon after the case went from Florida to a national story, and now everybody in the country was talking about it. A woman by the name of Lisa Byers had a friend, 23-year-old Tracy Paulus, who took some years off of college and decided to go back to school in Gainesville. So Lisa calls Tracy to inform her of what's going on, and Tracy is already aware of the murders and is concerned as well, but she had a roommate that she felt safe with. Her roommate was 23-year-old Manny Taboda, a tall, strong, former football player who was close friends and also took time off of school but decided to come back after Tracy had convinced him. So Lisa made Tracy promise her to call her back once she had got back from her classes, just to let her know everything was okay. That evening, Tracy didn't call back. 
So Lisa tried to call her and got no answer. She fell asleep and tried once more the following morning. Again, no answer. So Lisa gets a hold of a friend nearby named Tommy, asking him to stop by Tracy's. Five minutes later, Lisa then gets a call from Tracy's phone, and it's Tommy, and he's screaming. When police arrive, they find Tracy in her bedroom, naked, stabbed to death, and sexually assaulted, also positioned in the same way the other victims were. Down the hall, they found her roommate, Manny. He was also stabbed to death in his bed. Forensics processed the scene where they found marks around the back sliding door frame where it appeared to be popped off by a screwdriver. Also finding duct tape residue around Tracy's wrists, although they were removed after the crime. Gainesville police at this point were obviously up against a serial killer or killers. And when the news broke out that there were now a fourth and fifth victim who were college students, saying that one of the victims was a big and strong man easily taken down like these petite women, it sent the residents into a frenzy. All I can say is that you need to protect yourself against any intruder, anyone that you don't know in your, in your apartments, in your complexes, and make sure your complexes are secure. We're trying to marshal all the resources we possibly can Number one, to prevent any further homicides, and secondly, to identify our suspect or suspects. A lot of these students are very scared. Yes, and I, I cannot blame them. Obviously, you begin to wonder how secure you are in your own home. Arming themselves with whatever weapons they could, the people of Gainesville kept to their homes in fear they might be the next victim. That Tuesday, they had hundreds of students leaving school and did not return. Officers, state troopers, National Guard, military-style trucks parked everywhere. Gainesville was at its highest alert, but the people still didn't feel safe with no arrest made. After receiving dozens of tips about one individual named Ed Humphrey, a 19-year-old freshman at the university, arresting him for domestic abuse because he struck his grandmother in the face. Setting his bail at $1 million, which is higher than expected for domestic abuse, but this is a unique circumstance being that he's a suspect behind five homicides. With him behind bars and this large bail, it ensured he'd be in there long enough for them to investigate. People that knew him said he was mentally unstable, always carried a knife, and was known to walk around the forest of Gainesville late at night nearby the apartments, so of course he looked like a suspect. And on top of that, look at this man. Good God, I can understand why they assumed so. Even making him more suspicious, once he was arrested, the attacks stopped. But his blood type came back as A and the killer or killer's blood type was B. This didn't clear Ed of guilt. People still believed he was somehow involved. But everyone was back on edge knowing one or more killers might still be on the loose. Shortly after that, the FBI approached Gainesville police and suggested that they use their VCAP program. What it is is a computer program that allows investigators to enter the details of their cases and crimes, and it would compare it to similar crimes. So they did, and just one result came up from an unresolved triple homicide in 1989 in Shreveport, Louisiana, 800 miles west of Gainesville. Now on a Friday, November 3rd, eight-year-old Sean Grissom was dropped off at his grandfather Tom's house in Shreveport to celebrate his birthday. Also staying at the house is Sean's aunt, 24-year-old Julie Grissom, who was a college student attending Louisiana State University. So the weekend passes and after not hearing from Tom and her son, nor are they answering any of her calls, she knows they're spending time together because it's her son's birthday, so she pays no mind. Next Monday morning, Sean is supposed to be dropped off by Tom early enough to have him ready for school, and that never happens. The mother assumes maybe he took Sean to school for her, so she calls the school and they state that Sean never showed. She then calls a neighbor to check on Tom and her son. They do and nobody is responding to their knocks. 
The neighbor finds a way into the house through the garage and finds Tom dead from stab wounds near the kitchen. Police are called and sure enough they find Tom and eight-year-old Sean Grissom slouched in front of the TV, also stabbed to death. Upstairs they find 24-year-old Julie deceased as well with stab wounds, positioned in a demeaning way. It was later determined she was also sexually assaulted. Vinegar was found on the crime scene as if someone was attempting to clean up their evidence. This crime went unsolved. So, police are reading this information to this case, and they can't believe how similar this crime was to the five victims in Gainesville. First, everybody involved was upset because someone was leaking information to the press, but also the press was jeopardizing the investigation. But, as it would turn out, one of the leaks happened to be beneficial. A woman by the name of Cindy from Shreveport, Louisiana, who was watching the news, called the police and suggested they investigated a man named Danny Rawling. A 37-year-old drifter who was in Shreveport at the time of the triple homicide. Apparently, after the murders, he told Cindy's husband he, in quote, had a problem and likes stabbing people, end quote always walked around with a huge knife on his waist and seemed totally unstable mentally. Cindy and her husband took him literal and told him to stay away. In one of their last run-ins with Danny, he actually told Cindy and her husband that he was planning to leave Louisiana where there was beautiful women everywhere that he could just stare at all day long. Good God. So police research into Danny's background finding out he was raised in an abusive household. Jeez. His father couldn't really stand him. That's tough. And had a bad relationship with him. Danny then joined the Air Force and was discharged for being mentally unstable after two years. Then went on a string of armed robberies in the 80s. Was caught and spent most of the decade in prison. Came back home in 1989 to Shreveport and lived with his parents. It wasn't a happy homecoming, and Danny wasn't wanted. But he forced the issue and had nowhere to go, which was less than half a mile away from the Grissom family. Six months after the Grissom family was murdered, and three months before the Gainesville murders occurred, Danny gets in a fight with his father, where his father pulls out a gun and forced him to leave the house. Danny leaves, but goes to his vehicle to retrieve a weapon comes back and shoots his father in the head and stomach. Jesus. Miraculously, his father survived the attack and informed police his son was the shooter. What a snitch. Police issue a warrant for Danny's arrest for attempted murder, but he was nowhere to be found. So Gainesville police continue to look into Danny's criminal record and their interests are heightened the more they dig deeper into his cases. Then one of the officers remembers an unsolved armed robbery case in Gainesville that happened the same week as the death of these five students. Are you fucking kidding me? Apparently a masked gunman robbed the bank, but quick thinking by the teller gave the robber bags of money booby-trapped with dye packs, which explode once tampered with. Police search the forest where the robber was seen fleeing and they find a campsite with a bag of money covered in dye. Bingo gringo. Also, the campsite near the duffel bag of ruined money was a screwdriver, a gun, and an audio recorder. If this isn't the fucking sloppiest criminal ever. I guess the evidence wasn't seen as important, so they didn't even listen to the audio recordings on the tape. Forgotten in the midst of the Gainesville police investigation into these murders, which is understandable, the officer runs to the storage locker, finds the evidence, finds the recorder, presses play, and what they hear is unbelievable. Now I'm sending this to the three people I love the most. And I'll always love you. I love my mother. I love my father. And I love my brother. Now I got the sky for, for a blanket, the earth for a bed, and some rumpled up clothes for a pillow, but it's okay. It's 
just the way it is. You take the good with the bad. Yeah, I'll, I know I'll have to run the rest of my life. But I'm getting pretty good at it. Well, I'm gonna sign off for a little bit. I got something I gotta do. Aim for the lungs. Straight through the rib cage. Either there or the heart, but the best thing to do is hit the lungs. This man, Danny Carroll Roller. So now the police know for sure this man was in Gainesville in the same time as the five murders. The screwdriver also matched the marks found on all the popped doors of the victims. And through military records, they found out that he has a blood type of B. So his blood type matched that of the blood found at the scene of all the victims as well. Right away, Danny was charged for the murder of the five Gainesville students. They couldn't charge him for the Shreveport, Louisiana homicides due to lack of evidence. But on the day of his trial, four years later, he shocked everybody and stood up in court stating he was guilty on all accounts. His reason for this was because he wanted to be a quote-unquote superstar, inspired by his idol, the notorious Ted Bundy. He also gave a detailed confession to the Shreveport murders as well. Because of these confessions, we now know the details of what actually happened and how he killed his victims. A month later, Danny Rowling would be arrested for a botched armed robbery 40 miles south of Gainesville, finding out he was being charged for the five murders while he was in prison. And 16 years later, on October 25th, 2006, 6 p.m. Danny Rowling was led into the execution chamber in the Florida State Prison. He offered no apologies, nor did he seem remorseful for the atrocities he committed. Instead, he began to sing religious hymns to himself until he died from lethal injection. Boy, I love a good ending. If you've made it this far and are wondering why I even covered this case to begin with, it's simply because, to me, the human mind is the most fascinating thing on the planet. Why do we do the things we do? Do our thoughts shape our reality? Danny Rowling claimed to have had multiple personalities, but the psychologist who examined him stated the following. Mr. Rowling had an incredible amount of underlying anger, a borderline personality characterized by violent mood swings, impulsive and self-destructive behavior, narcissism and antisocial feelings, but presented no testimony of multiple personalities. Interesting. College and medical school textbooks point out that every human being has a second brain called the reptilian brain, located at the top of the spinal column, which dominates our fight-or-flight responses to our environment. But there are also researchers who say that every human has a small portion of reptile genetics and potentially, the more reptile genetics that a human has, the more likely they are to become a predator who enjoys stalking and killing other humans without remorse, empathy or sympathy. What a thought. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, Richard Attenborough saying, ta-ta. Has to tend with a big cigar. You give me a whiskey, cause I'm feeling a little risky. If the tin stars in town.